Hello and welcome everyone. Um, as you may know, we have been having a series of conversations about criminal justice reform because there is a legislative forum scheduled for March 25th in Arlington on that subject. Our latest conversation uh, is with Susan Surratt. Susan is a professor of sociology at Suffolk University and a co-author of a book uh, in 2014, Can't Catch a Break, um, and that is uh, the result of five years of uh, studying 40-odd uh, women in the Boston area and their day-to-day -day lives, and how it is that they intersect and are impacted uh, by an interlocking web of institutions, uh, which include um, child protection services, uh, schools, social services, um, criminal justice, uh, which is what we will focus on uh, a little bit further into the conversation. But Susan, first of all, thanks very much for joining us And thank today. you for having me. Appreciate your being here. Um, and I did want to ask you to start by just um, giving us a sense, uh, you know, we don't need you to mm -hmm. rehash all of that work you've mm -hmm. already done, but mm -hmm. to provide a, a, a broader context mm -hmm. for us before we, uh, you know, dig, dig a little deeper mm -hmm. on the uh, criminal justice question mm -hmm. about what kinds of conclusions um, you reach through your observations. Mm -hmm. So um, the study was a five-year study. It's actually an ongoing study, but we published a book after the first five years. I did this together with my colleague at Suffolk University, Maureen Norton Hawk, and we um, included in the study any woman we met at a couple of different programs and facilities in Boston, um, women who had been incarcerated within the year prior to the start of the study. Um, it's hard to say that there are conclusions that are, you know, broad and that. You know, but I think that probably the most um, dramatic thing that we found is that of the 47 women who started the study, there's one who now has what might be called a mainstream or normative kind of life. There is, is exactly one woman in the study. So we're talking about about eight years after mm -hmm, you first encountered these correct. women, only one of 47. Correct. So quite a few of the women are not in jail right now. Um, for the most part is because they've aged out of the jail system. So the women who are now 45, 48, 50, 55, tend not to be incarcerated anymore. Um, but it doesn't mean that their lives are the kind of lives that we would hope to have for ourselves or that we want to see in our communities. Um, only one or two of the women have had jobs consistently over the period. A number of women have had jobs on and off, um, typically Someone will get a job at Dunkin' Donuts where she's told each day what her shift will be the next day and within a couple of weeks it falls apart because the manager doesn't give her the right shifts or because she slips and falls on a puddle in the kitchen or because she has to miss a few days work because she's sick or un unfortunately one of the more frequent things is that if there's a male manager he hits on her. There's an assumption that women who have been incarcerated are all either prostitutes or are willing to do to exchange sex for other kinds of favors. So, so if, if yeah. I can interject, it sounds mm -hmm. then like the part of what we might learn from mm -hmm. the experience of these women mm -hmm. is that the margin for error for them mm -hmm. is much, much thinner than for other people in terms of how quickly things can That's right. come the, apart. And the margin of error for them is not in their hands. There's external things that are happening all the time. So one or two women actually did get reasonably good jobs, but after they were hired, their, their employer did a wider search for their prison records, maybe looking up other names they've used in the past, and then fired them. Um, so I see a similar pattern in terms of housing. So very few of the women were securely housed when we first met them. They'd been released from prison within a year. Most were still living in shelters of various sorts. At this point, I would say that most of the women have some place to live. But the place they have to live tends to be a room in a boarding house where there's very high turnover, where other people who live there include 
you know, men who were on the sex offender registry, um, they can't have anyone stay overnight with them. So their kids can't stay overnight. Uh, a partner can't stay overnight with them. Um, these rooms tend to be in pretty unappealing places. Um, one woman was very fortunate. Uh, her kids grew up and they arranged housing for her. And she has a room and it's, it's a decent room in a decent neighborhood with no public transportation. So that would be the kind of thing that happens. Quite a few of the women couch surf, so they tend not to count in the homeless um, roundups. You know, they're not lying in the Boston Common. They're sleeping on friends' couches. And very typically, I'm thinking now of a couple of the women that I wrote about in the book. Francesca is one of them. You know, she's learned that to survive, what she has to do is help people. So in, in the eight years that I've known her, she's probably stayed with five, 10 different friends and relatives who need help. So someone who's had surgery, someone whose husband just left her, um, in one case, someone whose mother-in-law was dying. And so she'll live with someone for a while, sleep on the couch, um, not be on the lease. So she's gonna be vulnerable to having an argument in which the person who is on the lease kicks her out. Um, it frequently happens that she'll stay with somebody who has government subsidized housing and they're not allowed to have somebody stay with them. So she'll get kicked out when they're caught having someone stay with them. So is she homeless in the time that I've known her? I don't think she's slept on the street more than a half a dozen times, but is she housed? Not really. So that's the story, that's the big finding of this project, that after eight years there was precisely one woman who is securely housed, has a real job, has a real family. The other 46 are still living these kind of marginal lives where they float among various institutions, various substandard living arrangements. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so as you were just saying, floating is a good, mm -hmm. I think, word because it, it connotes the kind of instability that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's the instability applies to things as mm -hmm. basic as where you're going to sleep, mm -hmm. you know, how you're going to eat, who, who mm -hmm. you can have contact with, mm -hmm. very, very basic parts of mm -hmm. our lives. And yeah. So, you know, I think that the instability is caused in, in a very macro sense by an absence of a public commitment to the well-being of all citizens. Um, so, I, mean, I personally believe that housing is a human right. It's a basic human right. And I think that the optimal solution would be for everybody to be able to have secure and permanent housing that they can count on. Um, but in a more micro sense, what I see is that the women cycle through all kinds of programs. And these programs have two problems, one of which is they're grant funded. So somebody could be in a really great program and then the grant runs out. Um, that's true to a very large degree at the community health centers. They'll get some kind of a grant to do some kind of wonderful project, but then the grant runs out. So there was money for people with hepatitis C, but that's dried up, and now there's money for somebody, for people who have something else. The other thing that happens is that most of the programs that are set up to help people focus on one set of problems. So they focus on housing, or they focus on substance abuse. Um, or they focus on jobs. So for people who have problems that are broader and intertwined, what I see for the women in my project is that they get kicked out of the programs that they're in. Um, one of, to me, the most ludicrous things that um, happens is that um, most of the substance abuse programs, including the detoxes, won't take somebody who has a co-occurring mental health diagnosis. Almost <laughs> everyone with a substance abuse problem has a mental health diagnosis of some sort. So someone will be in a program for one of those things, maybe a mental health program, and then they'll get kicked out for using drugs, or they'll be in a drug program and they'll get kicked out for having a mental health crisis. So again, I, I hear in the two things that you just cited, more of that same instability, either because the grant mm -hmm. runs out, they've come to depend on something mm -hmm. and now they can't, mm -hmm. or that compartmentalization, as you say, mm -hmm. of these programs intended to help, mm -hmm. means that, again, they mm -hmm. cannot count on anything lasting for very long. Yeah. And that seems uh, just, uh, just like uncertainty, I mm -hmm. think psychologically is a very difficult mm -hmm. thing for human beings to deal with. Uh, yeah. this, this is existential uh -huh. uncertainty in a sense, it so sounds I, like. I think that the existential you know, kind of issue is really at the core. Um, 
when I think about who's doing relatively well, at least for a year or two, and who seems to have totally fallen apart, and by the way, it's the same women. They all cycle through doing well and falling apart. But the couple women who I see are doing relatively well for a period of maybe a year or two are women who have found a place to perch where they're doing something that's appreciated and that gives their life meaning. So one woman in the project um, has been volunteering serving lunch at a particular facility. I, I won't say which one it is. And it's a fairly small place that serves, actually I think they serve breakfast, lunch, and after school snack to kids. She is expected to be there 7.30 every morning. The staff is small, there's just two other people, which means if she doesn't show up, she's aware that some people are not gonna get food and some kids won't get their after school snacks. She's appreciated. She's not just sort of one of hundreds of people coming through picking up garbage in the park. She's there, she's appreciated, and I, I talk to her on days when she's feeling awful. She's feeling the urge to go back to using drugs, but she knows they're counting on her in this job, and it's a job that has meaning. She's not working someplace where she's just one of a million minimum wage workers being exploited. In a way, she's being exploited because she's not being paid. But for her, she's getting something better than a paycheck right now, which is a sense of meaning in her life and a sense that other people care about her and appreciate what she does. And that really kind of dovetails um, well with the subject in general that we're talking about here, which is incarceration mm -hmm. and the criminal justice mm -hmm. system, because uh, clearly part of what happens when you are locked away is mm -hmm. you literally, you lose that sense of anybody mm -hmm. knowing or caring or being impacted by whether you're mm -hmm. there or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit more, but before we get um, deeper into that, I wanted to ask you about something else, and that is the, the striking um, one of the striking findings in your book is is the role of sexual abuse. Just how mm -hmm. I don't think you can even call it common. Almost, almost, uh, you know, mm -hmm. completely permeating mm -hmm. the situation of mm -hmm. women who end up incarcerated at some point mm -hmm. uh, with sexual abuse being a, a factor in their in their mm -hmm. early years. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I, I think that first is a caveat just to point out that sexual abuse is rampant in our society in general. I mean, studies show that somewhere between a third and a fifth of all American women have been or will be sexually abused at some point in their lives. So these women might be more extreme kinds of situations or examples, but they're not bizarre. They're not different from other American women in that sense. And even American women who have not been sexually abused, and the majority have not, even if we're looking at numbers of about a third have, are aware that this is a possibility. You know, one of the things that I talk about in my intro gender class is I'll ask, which has both guys and young women in it, I'll ask, um, if you, if you um, are late at a, some event at work or at a concert and you take the tea home and you get out and the street is deserted and you have to walk from the tea station to your apartment, are you nervous? All the women raise their hands. And I think that's shocking for the men to realize that all of the women live with this sometimes low level but sometimes higher level fear of sexual assault is something that can happen. In terms of the women in the project, there's two somewhat different trajectories that I see. Some of the women were sexually abused by family members, um, sometimes by a father, one woman by a brother, a number of times by uncles, um, one or two women by their parish priest, neighbors, um, and within the family there was no recognition that this was going on. Um, one woman um, whose brother sexually abused her, her parents, um, it, it, it was found out by the family doctor I think she developed herpes or something of that sort. And her parents told her to lie to child welfare services and say that this was a grandfather who had since died who was doing this because they didn't want their son to get into trouble. So general, a real lack of acknowledgement on the part of the family. Um, so many of these young women ended up running away from home. So that's one of the really common trajectories is this abuse at a young age and then running away from home to get rid of get away from the horribleness of what's going on at home. Yeah, and I just, I just, I, I wanted to, to throw in that I, as you were speaking about that, I realized, 
Yeah, I'd be quick, I think, in hearing something like that, fairly quick to kind of say, oh, those parents, how could they let, how could they do mm. such a thing? And then I had to remind myself, well, hold on, they're, they're talking about their son is doing something horrible, yeah. but he's their son. Yeah. And it's their son mm. versus their daughter. And mm -hmm. I, I just can Im imagine that that is a mm. racking situation for the parents as well. It, it is. In this particular so case, the woman has told me many times that for the parent, for their parents, all that was important was the boys. They didn't care about the girls. So there was something systemic Good, that was going on. Good, I can go back on. to yes, condemning yes, those parents yes. in my mind, I have to say. So once the girls are away from home and they're young and they're hurt, they're very, very vulnerable. Um, so they might get picked up by some nice, slightly older man who offers to take care of them, but then he turns them out onto the streets as prostitutes. They might be sleeping outside, and they're vulnerable to being assaulted again. Um, a fair number of the women were then picked up by the police and sent to some kind of juvenile facility for truancy from school or for running away from home. Um, a few of them got placed into foster care, and foster care is a very mixed bag. Some people are incredibly fortunate. There are some wonderful foster families. There are many foster families that are taking kids because they get a payment from the state for doing it. So a couple of the women were then abused in the foster homes they went to and run away, ran away from the foster homes. The other trajectory is women who, and I'm, I'm thinking now of one particular woman, um, she's African American and that, that's relevant to this story. She came from a fine family. There was no abuse in the family. She had siblings, they all got along, the parents were really nice. Um, but she came of age at a time in which there were just no jobs in her neighborhood. She was lived in a, a poor black neighborhood and there was just nothing. Um, she ended up taking the one job she could get, which was dancing at a bar in the neighborhood. Once you take a job like that, you're in this world in which there's pressure to go home with the customers at the bar, to do more than dance. Um, so once she was in that world, that's when she was sexually assaulted. Um, in her case, as is the case for quite a few of the women, there was this sort of intermediate factor, which is drugs. Um, so the life of being a stripper and doing sort of on and off sex work is pretty miserable. They turn to drugs. They're often encouraged to use drugs. Pimps often turn young women on to drugs. Once they have a habit, they need to be able to get hold of more drugs and sex work is the way to do that. Um, if you're a sex worker, you're at very high risk of being sexually assaulted, and there's nothing you can do about it. So it, when we think about the connection between sexual assault and abuse um, in, and eventual incarceration, some of what you've mentioned is that you, you know, uh, women can can end up in very risky environments because mm -hmm. of that that can happen they mm -hmm. can be they can they can lose their home whatever mm -hmm. stability mm -hmm. they did have they mm -hmm. as you said they can be kicked mm -hmm. out um, what what mm, what if anything have you noted is happening on a personal level what's the what is a personal impact or a way mm -hmm. a, that a woman might see herself if mm -hmm. that's at all relevant mm -hmm. that also connects to you know, ending mm -hmm. up in, in, in jail, perhaps. So I think this is a really important issue. Um, and I'm going to talk about how the woman sees herself more than the ending up in jail part um, first. All of the women in this project have been in numerous therapeutic programs. Some of them have been seeing counselors since they were eight years old. They were the bad kid. They were acting out. Um, they've all been in therapeutic programs. They've been in ones that are voluntary. They've been in ones that they've been court mandated to be in. They've been in one-on-one one -on -one therapy. They've been in group therapy. Um, so they've been in thera therapeutic programs. In the therapeutic programs, there's a very clear message that they get. The clear message is you need to take responsibility for turning your life around. That you can't stop bad things happening. What you can control is your reaction to them. So they've all been in 12-step and then 12-step kind of spin-off programs so they learn the serenity prayer, you know, accept what you can't change and change what you can. And what they're told is what you can change is yourself. You can make better choices in men. You can make a decision that you're not going to carry this anger and sadness around with you. So they come away from this with the idea that they individually are flawed. 
so many of the women have said to me, and I'm just throwing out a few quotes here, Susan, you're so nice to stick with me. I'm a nutcase. Nobody ever sticks with me. And yeah, my counselor told me that. She said, you just need to stop making such bad choices. Why do you make such bad choices? And this particular woman then turned to me and said, you know, she was telling me, you keep making bad choices in men. Of course you kept getting hurt. And then she said, turned to me and said, Susan, tell me, would a man like your husband want a woman like me? And no, no. My husband, who's an upstanding citizen and a computer engineer and, you know, a pillar of our local synagogue, he does not, he's not looking for somebody like this woman who's on the streets and who has an alcohol problem and who has a, an arrest record. Um, so I think that this message that you are the problem is not a great message to be sending to people. The reality is that for most of these women, they could change their attitudes from now to kingdom come and they still would not have secure housing. They still would not have jobs that pay living wages. They still would not be treated with respect in their communities or, or by society at large. They'd still have outstanding warrants, which mean that if they get stopped for literally jaywalking or littering and the arresting officer looks them up and sees they have an outstanding warrant, they can be carted off to jail. So they can't control any of these things. And I think that this emphasis on individual flaws um, really diverts attention from the structural inequalities, from the fact that there just is not enough affordable housing. There are just not enough decent and well decent paying jobs that are available. Um, so yeah, that's what they've internalized. Well, and, and it's interesting because as you say, this, this emphasis on, on internal flaws. Mm -hmm. Well, what I, what I was struck by as you were speaking was the fact mm -hmm. that even in programs earlier, you were talking about mm -hmm. a whole bunch of programs that, that have great intentions, mm -hmm. that are designed mm -hmm. to help. Mm -hmm. but but that's not how it works out mm -hmm. in, in, in real life. And I'm thinking about mm -hmm. uh, a counselor or a therapist or mm -hmm. something who's saying to a woman, and, and their intent, what, the, what mm -hmm. the counselor might be thinking is, I'm going to empower this woman mm -hmm. by letting her know that it's, it's up to her. Mm -hmm. it's, it's up to you. You, can, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can do something about this. But you know, maybe they know, maybe they don't know if the impact on that woman is really, mm -hmm. but if I can't, then there's something mm -hmm. wrong with me. Yeah. And I can't mm -hmm. because there's all these things stacked against me, but I'm, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna now internalize that and say, yeah. ah, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Then you've got, mm -hmm. you know, then again, mm -hmm. that's, that's something, mm -hmm. good intentions mm -hmm. that are So for the counselor, it's true. I mean, the counselor probably chose between law school and social work school and was able to understand, well, as a lawyer, I'll make more money, but I won't like my work as much. As a social worker, I won't make as much money, but I'll do something meaningful. The counselor had meaningful choices in her life and had at least some real ability to make a choice and then have that choice sort of work out the way that she planned it. That's just not true for the women that I know. So where I see these good intentions backfiring um, in a very dramatic way is in the job training programs. So all of the women in the study have been in multiple job training programs. Typically the job training programs teach people how to be an employee. So the presumption is that these people don't have jobs because they don't know how to get dressed up to go for an interview or because they don't have a resume or because they don't know how to set the alarm clock because they don't have good work habits. They don't understand that if you have a job, you have to get to work on time. That's, this is just not the issue. Um, so, so they all have resumes because they've all been in programs where somebody helps, someone good, someone good intentioned like me helps them write up a resume and helps them think how they can spin, you know, some class they took somewhere to, into something that sounds better. They might even get a nice business suit. But as one woman I, I describe in the book said to me, you know, I'd met her after she had done a, one of the best job training programs around, one that had a, a, a real internship and um, she worked in an office for three months as an intern. The intention was that this company would hire her at the end. This company has learned that what they can do is get free interns. They don't need to hire the intern. But she really believed she was going to get a job in the business world. I remember I went to her graduation. She was given a briefcase as a graduate, graduation present. 
And two years later, when she had not even, I mean, nothing went anywhere, she said to me, you know, I learned what to say on the phone and what to say in the job application. She's one of the few women who uses a computer well. And um, so she gets interviews and she says, but then they see an angry black woman with a do-rag and they don't want me. Um, so maybe her therapist would say, you shouldn't look angry or you know, take off the do-rag or stop being so black. Um, but I don't think this was really helpful. So she went through a long stage in which she felt there was something wrong with her. Mm -hmm. That she just must, she's not trying hard enough, she's not presenting herself correctly. The fact is that, no, businesses are not going to hire into a white collar job somebody like her. Well, um, as, as, as hard as it is, I think, maybe for, for you to lay all of this out and mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. me and the audience to, to hear about it, I think I'm going to ratchet it up a little bit more and, and, and go to something even harder for you and start asking or ask you for some suggestions or mm -hmm. perhaps prescriptions. Uh, specifically, mm -hmm. I'm thinking this legislative forum is, mm -hmm. is all about yeah. uh, pending legislation that's yes. in the state house and um, explaining to the audience what that is and, you mm -hmm. know, and getting kind of uh, both understanding and buy-in mm -hmm. around various bills that, are, that are, will be up for passage. Mm -hmm. The government, as we know, mm -hmm. works with programs and mm -hmm. sets up institutions and mm -hmm. agencies, mm -hmm. and that's what the government does, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You've laid out very compellingly that mm -hmm. In many of these cases, and mm -hmm. perhaps one might even say 46 out of 47 mm -hmm. cases, mm -hmm. um, those are, have not yeah. worked mm -hmm. well um, or have outright failed, mm -hmm. these women. Is there, mm -hmm. is, is there something the government can mm -hmm. do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think there's a magic bullet. And so I, I want to be very clear about that. Um, not, there's an enormous amount of goodwill in Massachusetts. I'd say there's a strong consensus that we need criminal justice reform, but all of it's been put on hold um, as we've gone through a process of a report by the Council of State Governments, which has finally been submitted, and the governor has submitted a bill based on that report. And the bill that's been submitted focuses almost entirely on reducing recidivism through having more programs in prisons and more supervision of people once they're released from prison. Um, I just don't see this as being particularly meaningful. Uh, I, I think that there are better bills that are floating around right now that I'd love to see them get some traction. Um, one that's particularly close to my heart is the primary caregivers bill. It's a bill that would encourage or make it possible or mandate, it's unclear how this would exactly be framed, um, judges to s sentence primary caregivers of minor children who have been convicted on um, nonviolent crimes to serve their sentences at home instead of in jail or prison. Um, what this means is that families will not be broken up. And I think this is absolutely crucial. Um, first of all, the vast majority of women in Massachusetts who are locked up did not commit a violent crime, and the vast majority of them are indeed primary caregivers of young children. Um, when a mother goes to jail, it destroys the child's life. Um, and we know that, and that's very, very well documented. When a mother goes to jail, it destroys her life also. Um, women in the project told me that you know when they, when they took my kids away, I was often running with drugs because there was, there was no reason not to use anymore. The woman I men mentioned earlier, the one whose brother had sexually abused her, when she went to jail, he got custody of her kids. Um, typically, even if there's a family member to take the kids, that family member is going to be less able to care for the kids than the mother, or in a small number of cases, the father. So that's the first thing. I think we absolutely have to pass this primary caregiver's bill get these women who did not commit violent crimes, who have small children or young children, get them out of state institutions, keep them home. And you know, people talk about putting an electronic bracelet on them to track them. Do it, don't do it, but give them good support at home. There's one woman in the project who, I don't know how she fell into this program. It's a program where she has somebody come to her house in the afternoon during that time that um. We used to call it the cocktail hour when our kids were little. I have four kids, and that kind of 
five o'clock to seven o'clock when the babies have colic and everyone needs dinner and everyone needs baths and the parents are exhausted you know, and you need a cocktail. Mm -hmm. Someone was coming and helping her during those couple of hours. That was brilliant. I mean, the difference that made, it meant that her kids had their clothes laid out for school. They had their homework done. She had someone to help her during those crucial two hours. How much does that cost the state? Well, not the $50,000 a year it would cost to lock her up, and the other $50,000 a year at least it would cost to have her kids in some kind of foster care. Um, so I think there are things that can be done. So let's start with the primary caregiver bill, but make sure that that comes with real support and not just threats or kind of punitive supervision. A second critical thing that has to be done in the state is bail reform. We continue to associate amounts of bail with the judge's assessment of how severe the crime is. Um, so that means that if somebody, I don't know, committed armed robbery, their bail will be set really high. If someone shoplifted toothpaste, their bail will be set really low. What this doesn't take into account is the individual's ability to pay the bail, to come up with the bail. Um, there are hundreds of women in Massachusetts sitting in MCI Framingham in the awaiting trial unit because they couldn't come up with the last $50 or $75 on a $200 bail. I believe, and all of the studies nationally show this, that it is far more effective to, um, for the ju judges to assess whether someone is actually a flight risk or not. That's the idea of bail. Someone comes up with bail as sort of a guarantee that they'll return to court. Particularly people who are primary caregivers of children, they're not going anywhere. The women in my study, and they're very typical of women incarcerated in Massachusetts, most have never been out of the state in their lives. Um, I remember the first time that I told one of the women in the study that I was going and visiting somebody in Illinois, her question to me was, oh, is that in New York? Because um, she knew there was this place called New York that was not Massachusetts, but that's what she knew of the rest of the country. So we have to have bail reform. Um, I would also think just, mm -hmm. uh, as another thing, that, that, that there would be a relatively direct correlation between whether a person could afford to pay bail and whether they'd be going anywhere. Because how are they going to get anywhere Absolutely. if they can't even pay Absolutely. their bail, right? Absolutely. So this means that the, the white-collar criminals end up not sitting in jail while they're awaiting trial. And then, of course, someone who's locked up while they're awaiting trial comes into court for their trial looking like a prisoner. and there's a much higher chance that they will then be sentenced to prison than if they come in looking like a regular normal person coming in from a regular normal kind of life. So I would say that bail reform is number two. I think number three is we have to stop the school to prison pipeline. There are far too many people in Massachusetts who are entering this whole correctional system when they're 14 years old or 15 years old. In some cases, it's because they were naughty in school. In some cases, they actually did pretty bad things. They were involved in gangs. They, I don't know, they stole. They got into a violent fight. Um, but we know, and psychologists know this, and it's been very, very well studied by neurologists, human brains continue to develop well into our 20s. To label somebody as a criminal when they're 14 is just silly. It's, it's not consistent with what we know about human development. It's not consistent with what we know about human brains. 14-year-olds who do bad stuff should be getting support. They should be getting help. And um, that brings me to number four. I think the fourth thing that we need to be doing is helping people develop the kinds of networks that keep people stable and that really keep people sane. You know, we human beings are social animals. And one of the things I always say in my classes is, there's no such thing as Tarzan. I mean, a human cannot survive out in the jungle on his or her own. We live in communities. We need social networks. Um, sociologists talk about social capital. You know, that's kind of the web of things that you do for other people and they do for you and you can call on favors. But this idea of being rooted in a community, I think, is critical. So I want to see us put into place policies that keep people in their families, that keep kids in their families with the appropriate support in the families, that keep kids in their school, that keep people in permanent housing. Um, 
so the woman that I mentioned earlier, the one with the horrible brother, so many years have now gone by, and um, she's living in somewhere in the South Shore, not a great place. There is there is no public transportation where she lives. Um, and she's helping raise her grandchildren. She is a master of relationships. And she has essentially organized her entire block. And parents help each other, and they they take turns looking after the kids after school, and they take turns walking the kids to the bus. She can do that because she's now been living in this place for two years. Um, she herself is not so stably housed, but her son is, and she's living with him. I think that if we come up with ways to get people stably housed so they can invest in their communities, build ties in their communities, are not afraid that they're going to be kicked out of wherever they're living, um, I think that we'll see some really good outcomes. I think it's very dramatic that all four of the things that you mentioned um, don't, don't really not they don't really touch on mm -hmm. the the conclusions of the council that we you know mm -hmm. that did this study that the governor mm -hmm. because uh, in another conversation in this series mm -hmm. and talking to a couple of the uh, mm -hmm. folks who are are uh, running the um, the legislative forum um, we talked about the different bills mm -hmm. different legislation um, divided into three rough r roughly three categories mm -hmm. the stop it before mm -hmm. you get in, the, what happens during mm -hmm. a, a, a period of incarceration, and, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. other side. And I noticed that mm -hmm. all four of your things uh, that, that mm -hmm. you're most concerned about really deal with that first mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. which, again, the organizers of the event mm -hmm. agreed with as well, that mm -hmm. whether it's restorative justice and diversion mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. whether it's bail reform, mm -hmm. whether it, it's community sensing. It's mm -hmm. keeping people out mm -hmm. of this system. Yeah. Is that, do you think, the really mm -hmm. worth much more of our mm -hmm. own investment mm -hmm. and resources yes. than whatever we can do once somebody is in prison or on the other side? Absolutely. We, absolutely. That's absolutely the case. And again, I think that if we look at this in a very individual sort of therapeutic way, we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, the way to end the school to prison pipeline, or at least minimize the school to prison pipeline, is to really invest in the schools. I mean, we all know this. We know this from studies, and we know this from movies, heartwarming movies that we've seen. The kid who joins the, the band, or the choir, or the cheerleading group, where there's a coach who is really invested the in the kids, and the even. kids make a community, those kids aren't out with the gang shooting things up. Um, so I think opportunities to make these kinds of personal connections to build meaning in your life. Um, there is something that's a little bit um, not, not helpful in dividing this mm -hmm. into these three stages of before prison, during prison, after prison, because the same people cycle through all three. So I refer to the women in my project as formerly incarcerated women. I just as easily could have called them future to be incarcerated women, because most of them did go back at some point in the time that I've known them. So th these things really do cycle around. Um, I think what's important to understand is we're talking about enormous numbers of people. We're not talking about a couple outliers who get into trouble and we need to do something for them. We're talking about entire communities. And now with um, the opioid epidemic spreading to the South Shore and to the North Shore and to Western Mass, we're certainly not just talking about inner city communities and communities of color. We're talking about most of the state. Um, in most of the state, there are large numbers of people who are unhappy, who are miserable, who are suffering. That's why people turn to drugs. Um, something's hurting. It could be something physical. It could be something emotional. I think it's often something social. So um, one of the things that troubles me in the bill um, that the governor has um, introduced is the programming in the prisons, that, that he wants to see more programming in the prison, it's again this programming on fix you, fix you. We, well, let's figure out how to fix each of these people. Um, the prison programming that I think is most useful is programming that allows people to maintain, maintain ties with the community. So if there's some kind of prison programming where people can go back into their communities for certain numbers of hours or certain numbers of days a week, Something else that I think has not been developed in Massachusetts, um, it's been 
much more developed in England, and I'd like to see it here, is volunteer opportunities. I mentioned the woman who volunteers at the Salvation Army. The reality is that at this point in history, there are many, many, many people who have become unemployable as a result of drugs or as a result of prison records. We as a society need to figure out some kind of a solution for these people. I am Jewish, but I believe that idle hands are the devil's playthings. And um, I see the women in my project spend far too much time sitting around doing nothing. They feel they spend far too much time sitting around nothing. They agree with this kind of American work ideal. They would like to be doing something. If the reality is, is that they're unemployable, then I think we need a broad-based kind of new deal, um, the sort of AmeriCorps programs that suburban kids do. I think we need programs like that for everybody to have opportunities to um, allow people to find what they're good at, to do something meaningful, to be busy, to be accountable. And that's not necessarily going to come from the private sector. So. Um. Is there anything, we, we have spent uh, the majority of our time, well, mm -hmm. we've spent all of our time so far, and understandably so, mm -hmm. talking about the particular plight and challenges of women mm -hmm. who are in, in, um, in this cycle that mm -hmm. you've so well described. Um, what, if anything, um, would you say, of all of the things we've talked about, um, apply just as strongly to men who are, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, in many ways in the mm -hmm. same cycle mm -hmm. and therefore might be addressed in, mm -hmm. in similar ways. So I think men and women live in the same communities. Every woman in my project has a father, brothers, ex-husbands, current boyfriends, sons. So to talk about men and women as separate entities is just, it doesn't reflect reality. So let's just start by saying that. Men's and women's lives are intertwined. We all live in the same society. We all live in the same world. My sense is that everything I've talked about in terms of the women is true and magnified true for the men. So for example, the way the prison experience separates women from their children. More men go to prison than women, and, more, and men have significantly longer sentences than women. That means that men are even more separated from their families than women are. And yes, it's easy to pull at the heartstrings and talk about this poor child whose mother was dragged away and sent to jail, but there are communities in which nobody's fathers are really around because they've been incarcerated. One of the problems that women face, um, that's kind of a men's problem, it has to be solved together, that a lot of the subsidized housing that people can get, um, they're not allowed to have anyone who is a felon stay with them in the housing. So what happens to a woman, I mean, it's, it's, this has happened to probably half of the women that I know, their boyfriend or their brother gets out of prison. He has nowhere to go. The prison didn't set up housing for him. He has literally nowhere to go. Making it worse, if he's on parole and he's not stably housed, he's probably going to be sent back to prison. He needs somewhere to go. Where's he going to go? Well, he goes to his sister or he goes to his girlfriend who A, doesn't have room for him because the place she's in is small, but B, she's now at risk of losing her housing because she's having someone stay with her who's a felon. Um, so I think these problems are interrelated, but I think that putting serious public attention into keeping families together, into keeping communities together, into not rushing to send people to jail, to not lock people up you know, who have $300 bail because they stole a car tire. I think these things are just as true for men as they are for women. Well, one of the things I was, I, it does seem to me there might be different outcomes mm -hmm. is, and it's a, it's a program that you've, mm -hmm. you know, that you cited first among the ones that you'd like to see mm -hmm. happen is the primary mm -hmm. uh, caregiver. And that seems to me w that that would have a disproportionate yeah. um, impact on, on, on mm -hmm. women in the system rather than men, because as you mm -hmm. cited, and of course it's true, I mean, mm -hmm. they're much more often the primary caregivers. Is there any way of, I don't know, tweaking that or, or mm -hmm. because it seems to me that that, that, that 
a program like that goes to some of the other things that you were saying. Yeah. It reestablishes that connection with their community, mm -hmm. um, gives them meaning, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. It seems like it would be just as beneficial for men, but mm -hmm. you could only probably have one primary caregiver, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point in history, the idea of you know both parents of children being allowed to stay at home is unlikely to happen. Um, but I do see that the women in my project have all been sent to parenting classes. The men that they know have not been sent to parenting classes. Let's see like serious parenting programs in the men's prisons. And by serious parenting programs, I mean something that goes beyond having someone like me or you come in and talk to a bunch of men on how you're supposed to be a father, but programs that bring the men back to their homes, back to their kids, and have them do activities with their kids. You know, help help men learn to be fathers. I think a lot of the men who were locked up never had the opportunity to learn to be fathers. So I think that's something that we can be doing and that should not be cost prohibitive. Well, I just want to close by thanking you again for sharing um, some hard-earned <laughs> wisdom, I think, uh, in, in maintaining contact with these women for mm -hmm. these years and just kind of seeing what, what has developed. Um, and just ask, is, is there anything that, we, that you'd like mm -hmm. to address or talk about that mm -hmm. we, we haven't touched on yet? There are two policy issues that I think are just important to, to take into account. Um, one of them is that, particularly in response to the opioid epidemic, which I'm not really sure if it should be called an epidemic, but the increased use and visibility of particularly fentanyl, um, I see a, a movement of saying substance abuse shouldn't be treated as a crime, it's a disease. So these people shouldn't be going to prison, they should be going to a coerced treatment that they can't leave. I don't see a big difference between those two things. Um, I think that we need to be asking ourselves as a, as a society, why is it that so many people, and especially so many young people, feel a need to take substances that alter their mood, their sense of themselves, their way of being in the world. I don't. I'm fortunate. I have a job that I love. I have a wonderful husband. I have four wonderful children. I have a great community. It's not appealing to me to zone out from that and get high. Um, but I think that I'm the minority, unfortunately, and you're probably the minority in this day and age. Thankfully, yes. So I think that we For need me. to do some real soul searching about why so many people are being drawn to opioids and to think about addressing this, if it's indeed an epidemic, addressing it at a communal level and not just at an individual level. So when the, when the Zika virus hit the scene and we were worried about the Zika epidemic, part of it was treatment for people who have Zika. But the bigger part of it was clearing up pools of standing water. I think we need to be thinking in those terms as well. The second thing that I think we should be doing in Massachusetts, this is a state with so many universities and so many academics, and we have so little data about what's going on here. And when we try to get data, for example, about you know, what are the bails set at for people on the awaiting trial unit? It can take a year, two years, three years. We need to get a state legislator who has a connection with somebody in the Department of Corrections to call in a favor to get us a little bit of data. We should be able to access the data that will allow us to step back and say, hmm, are there programs that really work? Um, one of my favorite stories to tell is of one woman in the study about a year after I first met her. She was so proud. Um, she was put on the cover of the newsletter of one of the agencies that does rehab programs. And you know, she was portrayed as just the star of this agency. She had succeeded so incredibly well. Two years later, she was on the cover of the newsletter of a different agency. She was, yes, she was incredibly successful in that program, but there was no tracking to see what happened to her after she left the program. And two years later, she was the star of another program. So I think that we should be able to collect and access this data so that we can, in a rigorous way, see if the programs that we, as good-hearted people, want to put money into are actually bringing about the outcomes that we want to 
want to see. Well, I Thank sincerely you. agree, uh, you know, with virtually everything <laughs> you've said, certainly the very last bit, mm -hmm. which is I'm mystified mm -hmm. um, by the idea mm -hmm. of how little good information mm -hmm. we are meant to be basing policy yeah. uh, advances and innovations on. It just seems crazy yeah. and like it's not, mm -hmm. you know, doomed doomed to something less than mm -hmm. success if so, you can't so, get access the so, data. So here's my other favorite story. Um, recidivism, which I said is, is the, seems to be the, the chief concern right now in the bill that has been introduced by the governor. Recidivism is measured by somebody returning to jail or to prison. So if someone doesn't return to jail or prison, it's assumed that they didn't recidivate. So I got the idea, and with the cooperation of a very good connection through a state legislator, the Department of Corrections, I got um, a list of the women who had been released from MCI Framingham in 1995. And I took those names and I went and I searched the death records in the state of Massachusetts. Almost 20% of them were dead. They are successes, they didn't recidivate. Um, I should not have had to go to the Department of Vital Statistics and look up each of these names one by one. We should have had some kind of way of, of tracking and that the idea that this 20% who were dead are counted as successes is very troubling. If you are interested in the stories that I'm telling about the women, I have a blog. If you Google me, Susan Sarad, you'll find my blog. And I often post updates about how these women are doing. Um, and I think it's just really wonderful to be able to see them as living human beings whose lives continue to evolve over the years. So Google Susan Sarad. So much mm -hmm. still to be done. Yes. Thank yes. you very much for the conversation mm -hmm. and navigating mm -hmm. our way through quite the thicket. So mm -hmm. appreciate it very much. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, for Professor Susan Sarad, I'm James Milan. Hope you've gotten something from this conversation. And I also want to remind you that even if you're listening to this on the other side of the March 25th legislative forum, for better or for worse, these are evergreen issues. These are issues that we are going to be wrestling with and tackling for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we hope it was worth your time mm -hmm. and we appreciate you joining us. Thanks very much.